I'm Tanya Fox, and you're listening to Fox Talks Business Podcast. I started my career in the corporate world, but always played to my own tune and love to think outside of the box. This didn't always serve me well with the bosses, so I made the decision to become an entrepreneur. And that little seed of entrepreneurial curiosity continued to grow as I branched out into retail, service, and franchise businesses. Now, I have been fortunate to have amazing successes in the last two decades, but they did not come without some really big failures and even bigger lessons learned. And that's why I started this podcast, not just to share the failures, but to show you how you can turn every failure into a success. We're going to hear from some amazing humans from around the world that are going to share their stories of the good, the bad, and the motivational entrepreneurial life has to offer. After all, life is too short to make all of the mistakes yourself. So why not learn from each other? And of course, we're going to have some fun because as I always say, well, you know what? I'll tell you that at the end of the episode. Hello, Foxy listeners. Welcome to the episode today. We're going to be jumping down rabbit holes. We're going to be talking about New York. We're going to be talking about LA. We're going to be talking about toxic family so much with my amazing guest, Susan Gold. Susan, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Hey, it's good to be here, Tanya. Thank you so much for all that you're producing and the great content that's so practical too. Oh, well, thank you. So let's give people a little bit more about who you are. Give us a little bit of background. Sure. So I'm an author, first first time author. My memoir just published. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. I, it's it's in your future again, too, I'm sure. Um, yes. I'm a con- consultant and a coach. So talk to us. I want to talk. I think I want to talk a little bit first about the book because this, I feel like, so first of all, the book is called Toxic Family, Transforming Trauma into Adult Freedom. And I think, so talk to us a little bit about what made you decide to write this book and then a little bit about what it's about. I feel like the universe foisted the exercise upon me. (laughs) I was told for the first time in 2007 by an Irish seer that I had a book to write and that it was going to help a lot of people. And then I was told again in 2020 by an intuitive. And I thought, I really don't want to go through that exercise for a PR tool seriously. And then finally, another intuitive said, oh, you have three books to write. So I was like, I better put a pin in this. I better get that first one out. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was a bulldog producer and I just sat down for 15 minutes in front of the computer, whether I had something to write or not. And that's how I came up with the first draft of the manuscript, but it didn't feel good. It didn't, I didn't feel connected. And a really wise friend said, you know what, right from little Susie's point of view, that little one inside you in your heart, that's been through this entire experience of life here on this earth. And I'm like, okay, I'll try that. And that's really, Tanya, when it all connected. Right. And it just, did you find that that helped you to be able to be a little bit more open in what it is that you were writing about or to think back on those moments? So surprisingly enough, it just gave me a huge container of compassion, compassion for myself and all that I stood up to and compassion for all the challenges and the challengers I met along the way. So it was a huge exercise in soul evolution and authentic truth telling and connection. Um, So yeah, it really feels like the gift of a lifetime. And so what was your reasoning behind, you know, besides everybody else? saying you need to get this out there you need to help people what Mm. what do you hope people who go out and buy this book what do you what are you hoping that they're going to take from it well what i'm told they're taking from it is they're different at the end of the book than they were at the beginning there's some type of activation and some type of insight happening as they read through the pages and i didn't want it just to be my story mm-hmm. i wanted it to be experiential so i created a workbook in the appendix that corresponds with chapters so um people can go through the exercises and they've been experiencing shifts 
um, in understanding and in consciousness, um, understanding about their lessons that they've received and their trajectories. So as you were sort of, you know, going through this lifestyle, you decided you had a dream of going to New York City. Let's talk a little bit about that. And then how did you get there? It, that's a really fun story, Tanya. So I grew up in a really tiny town in central Pennsylvania. And all I wanted to do was get to New York City. Like I wanted to bypass college. I just <laughs> let me go to New York City. And I used to watch Barbara Walters on my beanbag chair in my basement and my on my belly. And I was like, I want to be like her. Well, long story short, I made my way to the city. Um, and it was through an internship in college. And I ultimately went there, I was hired immediately out of college, but I wasn't earning enough. I was hired at ICM, which is a very large global talent agency. And they hand, handled all the glittering stars, you know, um, of the time, Cher and Woody Allen and, you know, George Clooney was up and coming. But anyway, um, I, I couldn't pay my rent. So I had to take on a side business. And I was personal trainer um, to Barbara Walters. Lo and behold, wow! She became my, yeah, she became my exercise client. There was a, there was a woman who was running the training business, and she said, "I got a call, and Barbara Walters needs somebody to train her. Will you do it?" And I'm like, "Of course." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, girl in the beanbag chair is screaming yes. <laughs> It's so funny how life has such serendipitous moments. And this was surely one of them. So one morning I knocked on her door at 7 a.m. And she took one look at me and she's like, get in here. What's going on? And she was a great interviewer and she got it right out of me. I had been sexually harassed the day before in the workplace. My boss had a little addiction and would invite young actresses in and excuse me for the afternoon on occasion and tried the same thing on me. And I was mortified. And Barbara said, I'm going with you this morning. We're going to confront this man together. And I was like, I you can't I'm have be anybody okay. better on your team. You're like, you just take the lead. <laughs> So I did, I did confront him on my own that day. He asked me if I had everything I needed. I said, yes. And he goes, you can go, you're fired. I'm like, okay. And um, Barbara invited me to become assistant to her then fiance, who was running Lorimar. It was a very um, big film company at the time, but I couldn't be somebody's assistant after that experience. I just had a horrible taste in my mouth. And with two and a half months of cash in the bank, I was 25, living in New York City, and I am ashamed to say that I had just extricated myself from an abusive relationship that I kept slingshotting back into because the gentleman held the purse strings, mm -hmm. and I was terrified to stand up on my own, but this was the true test, and my first deal was knocking on the door of the factory because I couldn't get anybody to answer the phone. Um, and to convince Andy Warhol to do a commercial for Pontiac that he did not want to do. <laughs> okay, I need more on this story. <laughs> <laughs> I was so brazen and I was so scared and I felt like I didn't have a choice, but the, I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't get anybody to pick up and it wasn't like, we didn't even have email then. That's how long ago it was. And I just decided, okay, I'm going to get on the subway and I'm going to knock on the factory door. And Fred, who was Andy's business manager, answered the door and looked at me through his hormone spectacles. And I explained why, why I was there. And he's like, come back tomorrow at the same time. I'll let you talk to Andy. I'm like, great. Right. So I knew like there was some kind of plus if he was going to let me have an audience. Um, went back the same time the next day. And sat in a little foyer, waiting, waiting, waiting. Then all of a sudden, the double doors into the studio opened. And it was dark in there. I'm telling you, I was scared to go, go in there. And there he was, like, in the center with this pin spotlight coming down on that crazy hair, right? Poking in yeah. a different direction. And scribbling, scribbling, you know. And three pugs were running around the studio. And they would, like, pull on his pants leg. And he'd grab one. And he'd lift one up. And he'd cuddle it. 
he could have cared less about my, you know, song and dance. He, he cared about those dogs. And then finally, he looked up, he looked direct in my eye and said, now really, why should I do this? And I'm like, because you can have the pugs in the shot with you. <laughs> and he goes, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I mean, and that's sort of... Yeah, that sort of marked my passage. I just was highly intuitive. Having grown up in the home that I did, that was a benefit. I mean, in order to stay safe, I was quite telepathic. Initially, I could read thoughts and I could intuit energies. And that's what I did with Andy. I could tell he loved those dogs more than anything in the world. And quite honestly, between you and me, I had no idea if he could appear in the shot with the pugs or not. Like, well, I'll like, figure this out later, but for now. <laughs> truly. So, okay. So how New York City to LA? Why that shift? Mm. It's a great story. Um, so I never thought I would leave New York, but I was starting to become a caricature of myself. And I had a cabin up in the woods in the Catskills. I loved going there. I'd drive up Friday nights and I wouldn't come back until early Monday morning. So I wasn't really taking advantage of what the city had to offer. Every other word out of my mouth began with F and followed by U. And I was just very intense. So a very dear friend who I had met actually on jury duty went out there to run a TV syndicated talk show. And she called me and she said, I need you to come out here and I need you to bring talent to the table for this talk show. And I'm like, okay. I mean, literally it was that simple. Okay. And then we chatted a few more minutes and I hung up the phone and my whole stomach dropped to my toes. I was like, what did I just do? I had this amazing apartment. I could see the Hudson, you know, I could see the Empire State Building. I, I just had a great setup, um, but it was time to go. I knew intuitively and I thought it was for that job. But honestly, it was to meet one of my greatest gurus of all time. And that was the man who would ultimately become my ex-husband. Okay. So, and you met him in LA? We were introduced in LA about a year after I was situated there. And I thought I met the man of my dreams. I thought I met my soulmate, my match, you know, just terrific. He worked for a, a cinema tech I was, I was producing for American movie classics, doing backstories on golden age of Hollywood movies. And I created him as an expert. He was amazing in these pieces. And we had a long courtship, probably about four years, and then decided we wanted to have a child and got married. So what was your biggest, you know, looking back on on that whole thing, because of course you've given it away that he's an ex now. What was your biggest takeaway from that whole relationship? Do you feel when you, looking back that you were like, he needed to be in my life because he brought this purpose for me? He showed me in a very clear way how powerful I am as a human being and how large my heart is, but how much I needed to turn that love inward towards self mm. and care for self. It all went out, out, out at my own expense and not just personally, but professionally. My boundaries were askew. So he revealed that in a very specific way in a way that I could not avoid. I could not sweep under the carpet. I had to stand up to, and it was an excruciating lesson, but it was necessary and it propelled me forward. And I really had layers of old, musty, dirty, crusty stuff that probably was there since, you know, I entered earth, just fall away. And it all started to make sense. The pieces of the puzzle came together and everything started to get better. 
my business life and my personal life. Well, and I think there's so many people that are out there listening to this episode today who are going through that. I think it's a common thing um, of being a giver, especially if, you know, you're female, that I feel like is something that for some reason we feel is ingrained, right? Help everyone else. And then, you know, it'll come back around and there'll be some time for you. What tips could you give those people who are feeling that, who are like, self-care is at the end of their list? Well, first I learned no thank you is a complete sentence. I also learned that it's not necessary to write back in a diatribe, in a long, lengthy email. Sometimes a short sentence is enough. I really had to look at that. So really keeping it simple. Mm. And then also breathing was important. I was one of those women whose central nervous system was just on overdrive. And my sensitivity is high. And I'm, I'm, again, I am intuitive. But I really had to slow down. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my first bosses in TV, I remember he called me in his office, he scribbled something down on a notepad and he shoved it across the desk. And he said, read that. It said decaf. <laughs> because I was so blue. I'll fix it. You know. Yeah. And I, go, I'm go, go, really, go, 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 go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really good at what I do, but but a lot of what I did was unnecessary mm. to the task at hand. And it was a lot of caretaking and it was a lot of covering for. And it was a lot of over responsibility. So I've really had to stop and breathe and be still. And this has changed my, my world again, personally and professionally. Yeah. I mean, people, people think I'm some kind of demi guru. They love to be around me. And I say so much less. I just, I just have better energy because there's more of it yeah. and I'm able to cycle it within and breathe and trust more. I had no trust before. And plus I was carrying more weight than was truly necessary, Tanya. I, I was carrying a 200 plus pound man on my back and our son. That was not necessary. And I think too often we get stuck in that, right? Like, you know, we miss the opportunities where someone is like, you know, can I carry that for you? Can I help you with that? And we're like, no, no, we got it. Right. And, and I always think of like, um, like leaving the grocery store or something. If, you know, if any, it's usually a gentleman is like, did you need help with that? I always stop and say yes. And I'm like, and people will be like, but you can carry your own bags. You're a strong, independent woman. And I'm like, you are stupid. If you think I got to do all this work by myself, if that sweet little man, if that makes him feel good to carry that box to my car, God bless him. <laughs> Go, Tanya, go. I love it. But That's it's a hard, crazy. right? It's a hard lesson because so often I will get that comment, like you could do, it, but why do I want to? Like, right? And it's, but it's a hard, it's a hard lesson. And I find even for myself, it's one that I constantly have to remind myself, you know, somebody sends me an email. I don't have to reply right away. They are not sitting by their computer, nervously hitting refresh until they get my answer. Like I'm just not that important. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. But that's a huge realization for yeah. so many of us. I mean, we were taught like to fight our way up the ladder. I did a piece um, oh, this was a long time ago. I think it was for Good Morning America. And it was on bully rods in Northern California. And these were women that actually had to go to like a class to learn to be softer, which in and of itself, I felt like it was abusive, but it was sort of the reverse of what women had to put forth in order to move ahead in the corporate world and mm -hmm. they dehumanized themselves. I mean, that divine feminine was smashed and, and there's more than a few of us suffering the side effects. Yeah. Well, and I remember that. I remember 
being very passionate going into meetings and having older gentlemen on the board going, you're being very emotional and me going, oh yes, a hundred percent. And if you'd like me to kick it up into the angry gear, we can go there too. Right. But it was, that was like frowned upon. Right. And so I had a lot of years where I, I stifled it and I choked it down because I didn't want to be too much for people. Mm. Um, that was a common thread for me. She's just, she's a lot. Um, and I remember taking, um, it was a Myers-Briggs assessment and, uh, just last La the end of last year. And in it, it says that I have an intensity that can frighten others. And I, you know, I read that and it made me laugh. And I remember telling my husband and he's like, that's really accurate about you. And I was like, yeah, but like 10 years ago, that would have been so insulting to me. And now it's so funny how my perception of who I am has changed where now I go, that's true. I love that I'm, you know, intense about everything. I love intense. I laugh intense, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. But I think for a lot of people, it's hard to find that balance. Well, and, and for me, it started early. I had to take on roles way before my time right? Um, and feel a, a sense of over responsibility within my home. My parents were doing the best job they could. My dad was brilliant. He was an astrophysicist, but he was also an alcoholic. And the whiskey cork would come out of the bottle at 7.30 in the morning and you'd hear glug, 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 glug. And my mom was basically stuck with a Peter Pan. She never got her turn to be officially educated, even though she was equally as bright as my father. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was an uneven platform. So there was a lot that I had to compensate for. Um, my sister was cooking for our family at eight years old. I mean, that's a big responsibility when I looked at my own son at eight years old. Um, but I, I think that I went into the professional period of my life um, just with these overreaching expectations and this vision of that's what a successful woman in business is. And then I really start watching the men who were kind of just like laying back and staying mom and answering in, you know, a short sentence. Um, and I just, I took a lesson. I took a lesson. Yeah. And it's, it's serving me. Well, and I think, you know, more people need to do that. More people, you know, my dad used to always say, don't explain unless you're asked. Oh, <laughs> I used geez. to always I, go, I, okay, <laughs> wait, what? And he would be like, yeah, just like give your answer and then don't explain unless you're asked. Why, why what do you your, feel? What was but, your dad's, what was your dad's name? Wait, what's your, Tony. what's your dad's name? I love that, Tony. I'm taking yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, you know, and it took me so long. I mean, he would, he would say this over and over and over again, and it never really sunk in, but I would find, I would do that, right? Like you said, no, thank you is a complete sentence, but I was, a, I would, you know, have that need to go no, because da da and like, give them the reason for the no, as opposed to just going no. And then when I was like, oh, I'll just, okay, I'm going to like, try just to be like, no, or yes, or like, just not explain my reasoning. And I was like, wow, there's a lot of times people don't ask. <laughs> They're just like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and they move on with their day. And it's like, oh my gosh, I did not have to fret over that answer as much as I thought. And you didn't have to fix it either. Yeah. So for you, like, you know, going through everything that you, you did as a child and then, you know, kind of moving into this career life, uh, you know, in, in a fast paced environment, because I can only imagine that whole environment is always ever changing and, you know, you're trying to keep up what made you kind of flip and go, I want to change what I'm doing now. Now I want to help other people talk to us a little bit about that. Wow. I'm so glad you asked that delicious question <laughs> because it's it's absolutely my joy so I have experienced a lot of trauma and I 
have walked through a lot of pain where others may want to hide behind a curtain, I stepped out. And I really see how my experience is a benefit to others. And I mean, strangers, right. others, because it's, it's helped me realize my humanity. I used to go down the, the, you know, the ramps on the freeways in LA and there'd always be somebody begging. And I was very Anne Rand about it for a lot of years. I'm embarrassed to say. And then slowly that blackness in my heart started to edge off. And I was really beaten down by the experience I received um, going through my divorce in particular. And I realized those people are human beings. They probably got horrendous abuse backstories and they're neglected horribly. They don't even feel like they exist. So I started looking them in the eye and I started opening my wallet and reaching in and whatever came out is what I gave them. If it was a five, it was a five. If it was a 10, it was 10. If it was a hundred, that's what they got. Mm -hmm. And that really shifted me. And I realized you know what? There's more people that may be helped by, by my own experience. And I want to put myself out there and help. And so who do you like when you're working with people now, what mm -hmm. is, do you see, you know, cause I see this in my own work. There always seems to be like a common thread that keeps happening, different situations, different compositions, but the same kind of little thread that's weaved through. What, what do you find in that aspect? Well, I find most of us, Tanya, really want to be heard. There's a lot of, of chatter in our society, in our culture, and it may not all be human, you know, it may be a lot of digital chatter and it's just discounting. So people want to be heard and people have stories. We have similar experiences. It may not be detail exact, but the feelings can be the same. Low self-worth, neglect, self-doubt, hurt, shame, secrets, violations. These are all important emotions and nuggets of story that need to be shared so we can take the weight off. I always think of, of um, Robert De Niro in the mission when he's carrying mm. that bag of crap up the side and he's clawing his way and he will not drop this bag of crap. And people that I work with now, they're carrying those bags unnecessarily. Just like you and I were going into meetings and carrying the room and we yeah. didn't need to be. And so I help them, Ace, just recognize the fact that you're carrying a bag and it's pretty heavy. Yeah, It's kind of nasty. And you know what? Maybe you're not the person to be carrying this bag. And, and here's some things you can do to maybe let go of that bag a little bit. Oh my gosh, the weight that comes off people and the glow that comes through and the grounding that happens. And then there's compassion that builds. Mm -hmm. And then that compassion extends to you. It's not just inside me. Now I'm able to radiate it to you. Do you find a lot of people just almost need that permission to let that bag go? Like they're almost just waiting for someone to tell them it's okay to put it down. So I'm going to say something that may be surprising. A lot of the people that I work with don't realize they're mm. carrying the bag. And right. sometimes that bag is from the past. It's, it's parental, it's family lineage. It, that bag doesn't even belong to them. They picked up the wrong bag. Right. Right. So if, you know, someone's sitting there listening and that sort of mm -hmm. vibrates within them, what are some steps that, that you teach that you could offer them for today just to take one step, you know, to take one shoulder strap off to, to releasing that. 
Yeah, I'm I'm pleased and I'm privileged to to offer this suggestion, and it really helped me initially because there's a lot of fear generally, and the central nervous system is usually amped up, especially now with what we're going through globally. Mm -hmm. So I don't even do the I love yous with the hand on the heart initially. I just take the hand and put it on the solar plexus, which is usually not very far from your breastbone like under that area. So it's below the heart. And I have them sit, can be on the floor, it can be outside, it can be in a chair. And I just have them feel the breath first and then have them say, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. And they just repeat that until they feel a little more in their body and not so spinning and a little more soothed. And that's incredibly comforting. And you can do it in, in a lot of different circumstances. I've done it in the midst of parties when the pressure has been big. <laughs> and well, I feel and like I the outside. I think this is a good technique, right? Because so often you get yourself into a situation where you're, you know, either you don't want to be there or you're just feeling overwhelmed, that overwhelming sense. Usually that's, you know, use that as a trigger to sort of take this and, and, you know, just bring yourself back. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other very practical um, piece of information that I offer is, and people sometimes don't realize it or I don't know. It's just not for them. We have a whole team that's assisting us, a whole team that we may not even be aware of. And when you look back over your life, there is going to be at least one miracle that you can relate to that team and they're with you. Yeah. I love that. You just have to be open to seeing that. Cause I think sometimes people think they're going at it alone. Like it's me against the world mentality. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody truly does it alone, right? Like, I think that's, that's the truth that people need to understand. Like there's just as there's no such thing as overnight success, there's no such, nobody does it by themselves. There's always some, some, someone or something else that helps you every step of the way. Yeah, it's so true, Tanya. So true. Yeah. So talk to us about where people can find more information about you to, you know, be able to to connect. It was funny. We were talking earlier about connection. I want true connection, Foxy listeners. No sales. Because we were talking about connection these days has sort of turned into this, you know, hey, nice to meet you. Want to buy a watch? <laughs> but where can they truly connect with you if they're like, that I, I just, I feel something. I feel some kind of connection, some kind of pull towards you. Where should they go? If you feel a connection and you want more, just go to susangold.us, susangold.us. It's my website. There's a, there's a lot of stuff there and you can even connect with me directly. I would love to hear your story and no, I don't want to sell you six sessions with me. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in your well-being and there's, there are helpful tools. So Susan Gold at us is the place for that. Well, I so appreciate you taking time to share and as well, all of the tips, because I think, you know, even, even just people taking a minute, like you said, to put their hand on their solar plexus and just keep telling themselves that they're okay, um, is something that, you know, people need to do more often is, is to turn inward because that's where everything is. And, um, and I, and I look forward to staying connected with you, but also to having you back on the show so we can help because I think this is something that people, you know, need to, to connect with. And we're trying, we're so busy trying to connect with everybody else. We forget the most important one is ourselves in my humble opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm right there with you. 
I really find that this day and age, there's so many times that transforming trauma that has happened into your life. And this could be anything. This doesn't mean you had to lived a very violent life, but changing that into a gift takes a very unique perspective. And a lot of the times we can't do that perspective by ourselves. but I really hope you take the tip of even just sitting with your hand on your solar plexus and just taking that moment to just be with yourself is so important. As entrepreneurs, we are so busy running like chickens with our head cut off sometime, trying to feel like we need to get everything done. And I love the tips of just answer more simply and take a moment to just have a breath and enjoy where you are at that moment in time um, and just slow down down. It's something that we all really need to do, um, myself included. I really hope you enjoyed Susan. We're going to have all of the links where you can um, access her as well as get her book. I'm excited to grab my copy. I didn't quite have time because this interview happened so hot so fast. I was so excited to have her on the show, but I'm going to definitely go and grab my copy. So don't forget to visit us at foxtalksbusiness.com. You can click on our blog at the top of the page. You'll see this episode and all of the links will be there for you. So I hope you take time, but no matter what it is that you do today, make sure that you have fun. Because as I always say, if you're not having fun, why are you doing it?